Hello, good afternoon, everyone. And while my um, friends and co-panelists get on stage and sit down, I would uh, start with saying that I was thinking that I would um, start our talk uh, with feeling grateful that I've seen this video before, because when I've seen this video first time, I cried, and I thought it's nice. When I come on stage, I will not cry because I've seen it already. But I must admit that um, at least hearing the sirens at the end of this video again almost made me cry. And um, there's so many moments of recognition and uh, sharing between me and this video, but I would also, shall we say, educatedly assume that also between the three of us, uh, maybe starting from you know, the time where the, this narrative starts, before the fall of Soviet Union, before the fall of Berlin Wall, we didn't share the same country, but we were quite neighboring. Um, and a lot of experiences and stories that we've seen and heard here, I think we know and recognize and we share. Um, we also share not being in Ukraine now and not being in Ukraine for quite some time, although personally and professionally, we have been and we are, all three of us, very deeply connected both to Ukraine and to the region. Um, and yeah, we probably also share not knowing life, the sound of sirens, because we're not, yeah, we're not living in Ukraine for longer or shorter time, but um, as many of other friends and colleagues, I think those sounds really make a very deep physical impression on the body, even if we never really lived through it. Um, and another thing out of many things that we share is also that since the beginning of the war, in different roles and capacities, I know and I'm quite sure that we have been doing and we are doing and we will be doing as much as possible not to allow this war just slid away as yet another war on the planet. Although it is, I mean, to be honest, another war on the planet. And we're trying to do what we can not to have it, so to say, business as usual. Um, for example, Anna is um, joining us today straight away from Berlin, where she opened an exhibition with um, her co-curator, Ukrainian artist, Lada Nakonechna, uh, with a Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Polish participants, which is called um, Distant, Tolerable Murder. Um, before we go further to understand why uh, Anna was uh, opening the exhibition, I will do a short introduction of the people that will be speaking today. Uh, so, Anna, Anna Lazar, uh, she's a curator at the Museum of Art in Łódź and a program curator at the House of Freedom in Gdańsk, capital of literature. Uh, she's writing for the magazines Nova Europa Wschodnia and uh, Czas Literatury. She often publishes in Herito and Kaleidoskop Kultury. She is a translator from Ukrainian, uh, in particular, Sana Zabushko, Ilya Kaminsky, Katerina Disa, and others. Uh, she's a lecturer in, a lecturer in the in Institute of Literary Research and Institute of Arts of the Polish Academy of Science. She carries out a number of public projects in the field of contemporary culture, both local and international. She's a member of the Polish sec section of ICA. She used to work in the field of public diplomacy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a deputy director and acting director at the Polish Institute in Kiev between 2008 and 14 and St. Petersburg 2015 2018 and currently she lives in Wolomin. And Vitaly Vitaly Chernetsky is a native of Odessa, Ukraine. He completed his PhD in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania, and currently he teaches at the University of Kansas. His research interests include, among others, and the list was much longer, I took liberty to a little bit shorten it, um, Ukrainian, Russian, East and Central European and Central Asian literatures and cultures, intellectual history of Ukraine and Russia, cultural aspects of globalization, Postmodernism, postmodernity, modernism, modernity, postcolonial theory and postcolonial writing, identity and community, film and film theory, gender studies. Uh, 
He's a past president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies between 2009 and 18, and the current vice president and scholarly secretary of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the US. In 2007, he published a book, Mapping Post-Communist post Cultures, Russian and Ukrainian, uh, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of Globalization. And the two words about myself, my name is Katerina Botanova, I'm a curator, um, cultural critic and um, a writer. I currently live and work in Switzerland where I co-curate uh, festival culture escapes, but um, I was and am engaged in many projects in Ukraine. I was a director for a Center for Contemporary Art in Kiev uh, for five years. I um, write and publish in magazines I also established one some years ago. But what I want to do now with all that said, our topic for the discussion today and our overall topic for the next three days is Russian war against Ukraine, decoloniality and art. And from your introduction and from what we saw in, in the video, um, both of you have quite a deep professional uh, connection in different roles and different um, you know, moments of time, both with Russia and Ukraine. You researched it, you studied it, you worked there. So I would offer you um, maybe a chance, if you don't mind, to start with a little borrowing from Vitaly, mapping post-communist cultures, sharing your experience and sharing your observation on how things have been and how things are between those two cultures. And maybe from that moment we can a bit approach the war and then move beyond it. Well, uh, I'll try and I apologize in advance for being very jet lagged because I just flew in across the Atlantic. Uh, but I promise not to doze off in the middle of my own speech. And uh, I would like to start by thanking the wonderful organizers at the Ukrainian Institute, uh, Tatyana Filevska first and foremost, but everybody else on the team. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with all the wonderful co-panelists. And it's especially lovely to reconnect with Katerina, who actually was one of the a translator who contributed to the Ukrainian language version of my book, which came out in 2013. And as a great honor for me, it won Ukrainian Book of the Year Prize in the middle of Maidan in the early days of 2014, an absolutely surreal experience. Katarina and I also collaborated on the Ukrainian language version of Edward Said's Culture and Imperialism, which was also a wonderful, uh, inspiring, and long-lasting in its impact <laughs> project. But uh, yes, uh, as, Ka as Katarina mentioned, I am a native of Odessa. Like most Odessans, I'm a mutt in terms of different backgrounds, you know, ethnically, linguistically, culturally. And uh, my own personal identity journey has um, been not without its twists and turns. And uh, um, I graduated a secondary school in 86, and at the time I was all set to uh, go study in Kyiv, but uh, a thing called the Chernobyl nuclear accident happened. And at the time, moving to Kyiv uh, just, you know, was felt a little freaky, uh, and I ended up um, trying and getting into Moscow State University uh, where uh, I met another one of the speakers who will be with us here later, Madina Tlastanova, who we were classmates there. And I can say that, you know, the moving to the center of the actually, at the time, still existing empire, but empire going through a lot of transformation and sort of in full accordance with post-colonial theory, it's that displacement that actually was a catalyst in my own identity journey and helped me um, indeed ask the cognitive mapping question, where am I, who am I, where I can come from? And the kind of sorting and othering and both the fascinating and the disturbing things that I witnessed and experienced in Moscow were uh, very helpful. 
Then also thank you to uh, the changes of Perestroika and you know oh, there was a lot of talk about Gorbachev who passed away a couple of days ago. There was an educational exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States and that's how I ended up in the US in 89 and uh, the Berlin Wall came down during my first semester there and I landed in the middle of this Western Marxist hotbed of intellectual work. Uh, I was at Duke University, um, met um, a whole bunch of graduate students working with Frederick Jameson and that was my main circle of friends. Uh, and uh, so to them I was a little bit of a native informant of a life behind that other world, but also it was a place that challenged me not to rest on my Moscow laurels and actually think globally, indeed engage with all those questions of where our experiences uh, intersect, overlap, structurally uh, can be homologous or in some ways illuminated by experiences of others. And this is why I have always in my journey, uh, journeys intellectually tried to place uh, what happened in Ukraine in comparative perspectives, which is why um, you know, I bring up you know, Arabic literature, why I bring up Native American stuff, why I bring up uh, you know, uh, West African intellectuals and others. And in this, uh, respect, I think it's very important to say that uh, what has happened in Ukraine has been a remarkable transformation that the world up until February 24th largely missed. There was a periodical surges of curiosity, but it is with a shock of recognition that um, we see the world um, belatedly trying to address with what more and more uh, people see, a situation of epistemic injustice. Uh, and uh, borrowing this term from feminist philosophy, it's, it's a term that speaks about structural uh, configurations of knowledge that preclude the very possibility of recognition and discussing of certain experiences. And uh, I think that this is what we were dealing with in the case of Ukraine, which is why we had this long persistent refusal to see, refusal to recognize, and also even among many people in Ukraine, the internalization of that diminishing uh, destructive gaze of the other, saying that you're minor, you're unimportant, you're provincial, your second rate, you don't have worthy art. And uh, this uh, colonial trauma, when somebody else is seen as the norm and you are seen as a deviation from the norm, is something that haunted Ukraine for a long time, but Ukraine has really broken from it in spectacular ways. And uh, we can talk about more specific cases uh, from the world of art later, but I don't want to monopolize the mic and would like to turn over to Anna. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also uh, would like to pass my gratitude to the Ukrainian Institute and Tatiana Filewska for inviting uh, me here, straight from Berlin. And I am very happy that together with Katarina Batanova, whom we know at least 20 years, and uh, Vitaly Czernecki, whom I met personally just now, but I read your book, have a chance to speak about the colonial perspective in Ukraine. Um, I feel a little bit like a bluebird here because uh, I'm not a literary research. Uh, I am rather practice, a pr practitioner of, of culture, but uh, truly what I can say that uh, for more than 20 years I am observing and studying Ukrainian culture, writing about this, uh, this culture and also like practicing uh, with uh, different like cultural project. Um, in the situation of uh, genocide in Ukraine, when Russia tries to destroy people, culture, 
and memory of Ukrainians, it's really hard to understand what is the good position, what to start off. And many of us, uh, people in Poland who uh, uh, observe and have a lot of friends in Ukraine, um, made the first intuitional uh, recognition what to do. First is to help and to serve Ukrainians who are crossing the borders. And uh, um, most of my friend, uh, friends just uh, go uh, through this impulse, and me as well. But the second reflection was that also the culture is the place where we should be active, where we should support Ukrainians, and wh where, what uh, the field we should study. And uh, uh, for the last month, this is also what uh, I am doing um, personally with the different institutions with whom I am uh, working uh, and with my Ukrainian friends. Um, uh, the answer for uh, this difficult situation is uh, to do what is possible to do in this difficult, uh, amazing situation. But uh, I was uh, asked by Katerina and also by Andrei Bondarenko in his film uh, to share the personal experience of uh, um, private life or maybe intellectual life uh, and its contact with, with Ukraine. Uh, so when I was looking in my memory what was the first uh, connection with Ukrainian culture, uh, I thought it was uh, um, the moment of my truancy from, from my school. I, I missed my class and I went to Warsaw from my small town. Uh, and I saw a very beautiful uh, book with the amazing uh, cover called Rybowino uh, Kur. It's in Polish. Uh, I would translate it like uh, fish, uh, wine and chicken as a person. Uh, it was an anthology of uh, Ukrainian contemporary literature made by Olag Nadyuk, whom I wanted also to thank uh, from, this, uh, from this stage, because she was uh, one of the first promoters of contemporary Ukrainian uh, culture in Poland, which, uh, and she showed that this culture has contemporary, interesting, deep language, postmodernistic, post not only rooted in the 18th century, 19th century, in the old uh, narratives and stereotypes. And it was my first journey to uh, Ukrainian culture. We had their uh, books, uh, essays of Andriy Pavushin, uh, Marko Pavushin, Mykola Ryabchuk, there was a uh, group Bubabu, um, and uh, some other authors. And I think it was like this first inspiration to go deep into the Ukrainian uh, culture. Then I decided to uh, take uh, Ukrainian philology as one of my studies because the other was Polish philology and also art history. I was never very like um, a super good student, but I love to <laughs> flow between uh, all those disciplines. And I think that uh, my current life is still connected with those three uh, fields which are uh, mixing in uh, the projects and I am, which, I am, uh, which I am doing. So uh, later I uh, was very interested in contemporary Ukrainian art. I'd visited Kyiv a few times and then I started to work in the field of public diplomacy in uh, Polish Institute in Kyiv. And then I moved to, uh, to Russia to uh, St. Petersburg. And this move was uh, partly connected with the proposition of job, like taking a part in the competition to work in Polish Institute in St. Petersburg, but also of my private um, decision to take a look at Russia more closer, because I was never very interested in Russia, actually. <laughs> uh, Russia was not like the field of my studies. Uh, but when they annexed Crimea, and when they started the war in uh, 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 Eastern Ukraine, I decided that it's impossible just to ignore this, uh, uh, this terrible uh, identity in the eastern border of our world. And really, it was an uh, important experience because I met a lot of people, a lot of artists, and I think that I understood the main difference between like Ukrainian artists and Russian artists. It is a bit uh, essentialistic, but still, I think that uh, 
uh, as a person who sells, st tells the um, individual story, I can uh, say something like this. Uh, because the main difference in these uh, Ukrainian institutions and Russian institutions was uh, in the people who are working in. I believe that Ukrainian created institutions for themselves, for the people who are around them, and Russians just like play certain roles of, uh, of the institutions and they couldn't like uh, um, change those structures for being more human. So this is like uh, this personal story, uh, uh, not to make my speech too long. Uh, I just will tell that maybe later I could uh, uh, say a bit about like a Polish perspective to the context with Ukrainian culture and certain cliches, but uh, I wouldn't like to speak too long, so thank you. But I will um, you know, give this opportunity right back to you. <laughs> Um, in, in a certain way, um, because what I wanted to ask both of you, um, we're talking about um, kind of our professional, intellectual and personal uh, connections to the region. Um, so Eastern Europe in general, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, and in the work that both of you are doing, um, different parts of those regions are connected either through comparison or through um, a certain kind of gaze from one position to another position. Um, I know you did a, um, an exhibition, or you sort of conceived the idea of an exhibition in 2011 that then uh, your Polish creator Monika Szewczyk did, The Journey to the East, oh, yeah. right? It was a <laughs> Polish view and a Polish research on the um, countries of the former Soviet Union that are mm -hmm. uh, still now called the uh, Eastern uh, partnership, rather the Eastern uh, um, boundary of the European Union. So it was kind of a Polish view to the East. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vitaly, in your work, in your research, I mean, in the book that we were talking today, um, and also, you know, in your study of film, as far as I know, it's, it's also, it's a comparison or it's um, a view towards Ukrainian and Russian films, Ukrainian and Russian culture. So my um, personal professional question, when we, when you look from the position of now, you know, after half a year of the war, to your own intellectual interest and what you've been doing, uh, why is it always Ukraine and something else? Why is always Ukraine from the position of an outside in a comparison to something? H how does it work for you? How do you see it now? Well, in my case, I mean, this is partly because of the structures of the field of Slavic studies and indeed that um, folks who were working on Ukrainian topics only were really isolated and ghettoized. And uh, I, by choosing just even not to be like a narrow Slavist, but by going into the field of uh, comparative literature broadly conceived, which, you know, is no longer about just, you know, comparing literatures, but has become a literary scholarship across national boundaries, across disciplines. What I try to do is, uh, in the book, is mount a bigger argument about uh, the version of a global postmodernist condition that arose in what used to be called Second World, and then also the first responses to the discourse on post-colonialism as the Soviet empire was falling apart and then fell apart. And in my book, I chose Russia and Ukraine as two contrastive case studies. And at the time, I was still trying to, in both places emphasize the potentially good, interesting, productive, but just even saying that the way uh, the two countries and their respective cultural fields reacted to the changes of perestroika and then collapse of the Soviet Union and the years of post-Soviet development, what was highlighted, what was interesting, what the creative folks were pursuing were quite distinct and different. And I encountered a lot of resistance actually from senior colleagues and from presses early on and they just basically everything ukrainian was seen as again as second rate and boring we see this uh, now 
a lot of people with shock discovering there are all, all these great things. There is a, uh, a very highly respected Bulgarian film critic, Dina Jordanova, who teaches at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. She has been posting on social media her discovery of Ukrainian films of the 60s and the 70s, saying, they're so good. This is magic realism that is on par with all those other countries. How come nobody told me about that? How come those things were not available? And, and it's because actually she speaks to a lot of people who have no knowledge of Ukrainian culture. Dina's posts are doing this kind of work of opening people's eyes to the interesting creative past of Ukrainian culture, not just contemporary culture, in a way that cannot be discounted by the prejudice, oh, it's just yours, that's why you like it. So this is somebody who is very much an outsider with no direct investment in Ukraine, who has um, an authority in the field as a critic and is doing those kind of things. And in my case, I just later, you know, again was thinking about the cultural discourse of globalization, the various phenomena of glocality, the global local fusing, and uh, Again, uh, Ukraine has been doing remarkable, interesting things, but for the world to hear very often, you needed to put it into this broader context because Ukraine per se, Ukraine as such, was sadly until February 24th was not necessarily seen as cool the way our host country, Italy. You do not have to say Italy and, or even Venice and, in order to uh, bring people attention to Venice and, or Italy more broadly. And in the case of Ukraine, just because of those structures of knowledge, this uh, paradigm of epistemic injustice that was precluding people from seeing Ukrainian culture as interesting and valuable and having something to say on the global stage in its own right, that is the issue. And this is uh, where tragically took this horrible war, the suffering, the deaths, the destruction uh, for the world to shudder and wake up and start paying notice. Hopefully not too late. Uh, yes, it's uh, very interesting. Thank you very much for, for such a beautiful reflection. Uh, when you were talking, I thought, what can I answer for this question? And I decided that I will be honest. <laughs> so um, why not to study only Ukraine or why not to uh, look only on the Ukrainian culture? Why is it uh, impossible? Well, I think it is possible, but it's quite conservative. And what we really need in this uh, modern global world is to look for the new narrations, not to make a repetitions from the 19th century when we try to build kind of uh, national discourse that uh, embodied in a um, special kind of um, culture in one uh, specific country connected with the blood and with the land, but rather to look for a different perspective and different uh, connections. And I believe that contemporary Ukraine and, its, uh, and the culture of Ukraine uh, shows that kind of narratives, if, uh, for example, like people are uh, thinking about themselves mostly as a citizens. Uh, they are not creating nationalistic discourse, although during the war it's so simple. Uh, this culture which we can see is inclusive. Uh, many people are like invited to be Ukrainians, not only because of the blood, but also because of the moral, ethical and uh, cultural choices. So um, the projects which uh, I was creating together with Monika Shevchik, with Ladana Konechna and with many of my other friends in different uh, uh, connections was always this question uh, of uh, showing certain kind of uh, uh, wider perspective, uh, perspective which is not uh, rooted in 19th century notions. And what I really like is uh, to uh, uh, show uh, the possibility of other questions that we used to hurt because 
decolonization, in my opinion, uh, opinion of like, I would say, uh, is to create a new field, new field of uh, knowledge, new field of questions, new field of relations. And for example, Katya, it was really so nice that you mentioned the Eastern J Journey because it was the project from 2011 and we had a lot of fun with Monika Shevchik when we did it and traveled around the Eastern European countries. Um, we used the, as a central notions, love, but not love in the intimate uh, um, variation, but rather like civic love people who will share their empathy, they will uh, support each other, but not exactly not, uh, again, not in the infantile way, just to be nice to each other, but rather to look for the different kind of bounds in the society. And we wanted to uh, ask these questions to the post-Soviet cultures, uh, which were uh, really deeply ruined by the Soviet Union and by um, using the notions that uh, were depicting something else that was really uh, in uh, everyday life. Uh, it was kind of like a distraction of many uh, beautiful ideas. And actually, uh, right now, what we can see in uh, different like uh, situations, in uh, art uh, uh, exhibitions, in uh, novels and in uh, like other spheres of contemporary culture is uh, lack of uh, idea what the future can look like. And this is really like sad moment and it is also connected with the genocidal uh, element of utopia. Yeah, Utopia built a certain kind of idea of a future world, but to uh, have this future world, we have to kill all the people who are not agree with us <laughs> about this uh, future. And uh, this uh, moment of uh, uh, imagining the future world uh, was lost somehow. People went back to trauma and start to uh, look uh, uh, in the past, in the archives, in their own uh, traumatic uh, past, the answers why the world like this looks like. So uh, mm, these questions about future, especially now, are very fragile and uh, uh, easy to um, to be lost. So uh, uh, I believe that uh, some simple questions uh, uh, can be asked again and again, but we have to uh, remember that uh, some answers already failed. But still, we can ask about solidarity, about love and about social uh, possibilities in future. Uh -huh. Thank you, Anna, for these beautiful reflections, especially ending with solidarity and love. It made me think of uh, how Derrida in his final year said that justice and love are two things that are undeconstructable. And uh, it also brought me to reflections about, indeed, projects of this kind uh, that are trying to do interesting, you know, colleagues who are doing interesting, thoughtful things, and uh, I'm thinking of the curatorial group in Ukraine, Manula Maybutnya Mestetstvo, Past Future Art, one of whose leaders happens to be a secondary school classmate of mine, Oksana Dohopolova, uh, who, and uh, the work that she did with the legacies of Bab and Yar and, and the art exhibition that they did in Poland, which I would not be able to describe very well, but the very uh, dealing with all these things of memories and traumas, but not in the oppressive, yes. um, crushing way, but as something that indeed opens the possibility for the future. Uh, the uh, work that she and others have been doing in transforming the legacy of the city of Odessa, both using the concept of multi-directional memory, which is very important here, but also by seeing what alternative mythologies of the city have been suppressed and neglected, and can those suppressed, neglected uh, alternative mythologies uh, be a source of productive growth. This is also something that Ivan Kozlenko talks about in his novel and in his other comments on the city of Odessa. And this is interestingly where visual art, which was less paid attention as opposed to Odessa's literary myth, is giving us a more 
interesting and productive legacy and both the, proce the processing of the past, uh, uh, all the work that was recently being done rethinking and reconceptualizing the Odessa Art Museum, the series of exhibitions that the late Alexander Reutburt and Kirill Patak put together, processing and rethinking the entire long 20th century and what happened there and how it was visually represented and constructing a stunningly powerful, absolutely different and very moving narrative that is indeed open to the future. And of course, one has to realize that all of that work has been taken down from the walls of the museum. It is now in storage for safekeeping because of the war. And that museum building did sustain some damage from shelling. Of course, the official Russian government thing was that the shelling supposedly military targets at the port, but they were not a military target and they did damage the art museum. I would want us to um, go back and think about the Ukrainian art uh, and the changes in Ukrainian art, uh, at least in the last, what is it, eight years, but in a moment. But before that, I wanted to, um, maybe shortly, maybe not, depends on us, um, jump to a bit different and more maybe theoretical part of our discussion. We're talking about, you know, Anne, we're talking about you know, love and care and solidarity. Those notions are a, a part of the emancipatory discourses. And decoloniality itself is and also comes also from the emancipatory discourses, from the, the, the desire of rethinking and revaluing and giving more voice and more power to different knowledges, right? To, to knowledges that come uh, not from the Western canon, but elsewhere. And we're talking that de decoloniality itself comes from the, the thinkers and the practices in um, South America, for example. And tomorrow there will be a lecture by Madina Tlustanova. We'll know more about it, but just shortly. Um, so the, the connection um, of histories and thinking, you know, in South America um, then made their th way through to the African thinkers, and Vitaly, you mentioned you know, the West African, but in general, the, the thinking of the, the, the African history and present from both inside the continent and from the diaspora is also heavily based on decoloniality and on this re-evaluation and reviewing the systems and structures of knowledge and also thinking about the future, because thinking about the future is an important part of, of decoloniality as, as a certain right, discursive change. But what I wanted to ask is that why was it possible and still possible for quite a long time now uh, for this um, instrument of you know, decolonial thinking to be present um, in South America, to be present in Africa. But Eastern Europe and Ukraine is a part of Eastern Europe well, until, until recently, until the beginning of the war and still the beginning of the war is just maybe a turning moment but not a turn itself was a completely white spot. It was not present there. And even now when, I don't know where you experienced it, but I mean, I, I did, when we try to talk with the colleagues from the parts of the world that I just mentioned about, again, solidarity, kind of a decolonial solidarity, um, there's not always an understanding. And in the best case, there's non-understanding. In the worst case, there is a bit of a, a competition of victimhood. Okay. So my question is, why was it possible that in this sort of a global movement uh, of decoloniality, Eastern Europe completely fell through? And is it possible and how is it possible to build or to attempt solidarities with others today? Probably, Vitaly, you are more uh, uh, perfect to... You, you, you should speak first, but I thought that I will take my... <laughs> Uh, before you, even in your great book, uh, which was already mentioned a few, few times uh, here in this uh, discussion, uh, you said that uh, um, this perspective of the coloniality uh, was built from the Anglo-Saxonian um, uh, point of view and that uh, Eastern European thinkers were not very present unless they were Russians. <laughs> Because we have like many uh, examples of uh, uh, like studies that are based on like Russian culture, 
Um, uh, I have like two thoughts about this, but I would be very happy to hear your answer. Well, um, this is actually something that I have struggled with and something that I've even on the personal level, when I came to United States as an exchange student and met all of these other young people from uh, the rest of the world from many different countries and tried to build bridges, I always f felt myself to be this kind of a bridge builder figure. And then if we look in the Ukrainian past, actually in the Ukrainian canon, Shevchenko's Kafkaz is this kind of solidarity establishing gesture that uh, is unique and it was then uh, my former student and dear friend, friend Rory Finnan who I think is most powerfully articulated in English how uh, Shevchenko's Kafkaz is a text that sends this kind of message of solidarity and we see then others in Ukraine building upon it. I'm thinking of Serhii Senhaivsky's novel, The Road to Asmara, which is now being translated into English, where we have a Ukrainian perspective of a Ukrainian military translator in the Soviet army in Ethiopia in the mid 80s, and how he, seeing Ethiopian famine, uh, completely, I mean, a transformation happens to this person. And, but this is again, uh, from the perspective of Ukrainians learning from the world perspective. As for uh, the situation with other countries, uh, there is a learning, but it takes a long time, and part of it is against structures of knowledge. I uh, recently traveled to South America to two countries which have happened to have historically a large Ukrainian diaspora, Argentina and Brazil, and in Argentina, there is no serious East European studies institutionally to speak of, and that's the legacy of military dictatorship because they were afraid of universities, period. As my Brazilian colleagues uh, explained, the Brazilian military dictatorship was more of a technocrat, and they didn't want to destroy the universities altogether, which is why there the situation perhaps was slightly better, but Brazilian, um, Slavic studies were incredibly Russo-centric and continued staying Russo-centric basically until February 24th. They have had an aha moment and they're actively seeking to change. So there is no resistance to changing. There is an openness to that. But this is uh, a legacy of different ways of being within a multicultural society. And that uh, the fact that even though there were uh, significant Ukrainian diasporas and still are in Argentina and Brazil, they did not make the kind of allyship that for example in Canada, uh, the Ukrainian diaspora have made with the indigenous, with the First Nations. So Canada, in this sense, is a very positive, very interesting example of this kind of allyship and solidarity uh, of the kind um, in Argentina and Brazil for some reason did not happen. But it did not happen in the past. There is a recognition in the present and there is hope for the future. On the Avenida Paulista, right in front of the uh, famous art museum in San Paulo, there was a wonderful street artist who the biggest painting that was on his display was his response to the in invasion of Ukraine and a very powerful work. And the fact that he felt that to be necessary and so that, you know, in the middle of Anita Paulista in May of this year, that was this big painting to me was an experience that, yes, that far away, that part of the world still cares. Um, thank you for this uh, global context. Um, I stuck to Eastern Europe uh, uh, thinking about uh, the answer uh, uh, for, for your questions, Katya, uh, for your question, last question, Katya. And uh, again, um, 
why uh, the, the colonial perspective appeared so late, let's say, not only in Ukraine, which uh, already had few essays and studies on the coloniality, and in Poland. Uh, we had uh, studies of uh, Emma Thompson in late 80s, translated into Polish from English, of course, about uh, uh, um, Russian 19th century poets who were uh, imperialist uh, uh, and supported uh, conquering of Caucasus. Um, but uh, this perspective uh, in Poland was uh, mo mo more um, rooted in uh, Polish and Ukrainian um, relations. Uh, I wouldn't like to talk a lot about this because we would like uh, dive in the ocean of, uh, of history. But uh, uh, one general reflection is that um, um, the colonial uh, studies uh, are not only rooted in the history, are not only rooted in the identity studies, they are also rooted in the economy. And the economy hasn't changed so much. <laughs> So actually, a lot of uh, violent uh, uh, relations are still present in our everyday life. Uh, for example, after the Second World War, um, this lang language of emancipation and uh, like uh, uh, empowering of working class was somehow stilled, uh, or even uh, mm, distracted by uh, by the. Mm, language of lies that didn't depict the reality. And uh, uh, only a few years ago in Poland we could uh, see the studies about, uh, uh, which were um, describing the life of peasants in Poland because it was not a good type of studies. Nobody would like to uh, think about those people, uh, village people are boring and uh, they were already like uh, many times dis described in Polish, uh, Polish Republic uh, history. But right now uh, we are looking at the, the real new kind of discourse and I think that in Eastern Europe what is really important is to see the other in ourselves. That means uh, that, for example, there was no slaves that were uh, different in the color of the skin or the religion, although there was that kind of uh, uh, cases, but uh, it was the people which were uh, next to us and they were exactly like the same. Uh, but the economy was uh, set in uh, in different in different uh, way. And uh, what is really interesting that uh, in Ukraine, I believe that the society was built in on more egalitarian uh, level. For example, uh, Taras Shevchenko was a peasant guy who was uh, a slave uh, for a long uh, period of his life. Uh, so when I hear Shevchenko, which is quoted in the street uh, of uh, Ukraine during the uh, Orange Revolution, Dignity Revolution, and during the war, I do understand that his claims are still actual, because a lot of things that uh, were uh, uh, problematic in 19th century returns to our reality in a very violent way. And uh, actually, what is happening now in Ukraine is not only the fight against the Ukrainian culture, but it is also a fight for the resources, uh, for the land and for the people, and for the possibility to trade. So um, the colonial perspective in Ukrainian studies should also uh, take into the consideration the economical uh, aspects, including the role of oligarchs and so on and so on. So you basically started to answer my, my next question, which is, we can say to a certain extent, maybe banal, but I do believe that we we need to refer and go over and over it, you know, as many times as we need ourselves and also, you know, the people that we talk to. What does it mean then to look at Ukraine through decolonial optics? Why is it productive and to which extent it's productive? And you, um, you started answering that by saying, you know, seeing the other in, in ourselves. Um, and uh, Ukrainian position is not very strong there yet but it's, it's changing, um, looking at the economical interests behind it. But what else and how, sort of, what does it mean to look at Ukraine through decolonization? Well, uh, I've uh, 
mentioned, well, I mentioned West Africa, one of the thinkers who uh, really was influential in my own work, I mean, he's not based in the United States, he used to be based in the UK, but he's originally from Ghana, is Ada Kwesen. And uh, his book, Postcolonialism Theory, Practice, a Process. And uh, that is, um, this is where the post and the D uh, and the different understandings of the post, I mean, they sort of are beginning to uh, fuse and at least be in productive dialogue, in that there is a global process of change and basically in its social and cultural identity transformation in creating this new imagined community that imagines itself and thinks itself and acts in different ways, Ukraine now is that vanguard, that locomotive that is pulling the world's global decolonizing processes. So this is not just within the context of one country or even one or several broader regions that uh, are involved. I mean, this is something that is in fact uh, with profound global implications. And therefore, um, it would be foolish to discount it and foolish to ignore it and the world, if it ignores it, will be to its own peril. And uh, this is not you know, so much to poo-poo uh, past mistakes or present you know, lazy ignorance that is still often happening, but to, on the contrary, encourage those who with no biographical connection, with um, no even obvious intellectual connection to Ukraine, have discovered uh, these things, have been doing things. Organizing, for instance, artistic residency programs or putting together literary anthologies and translation or doing other kinds of things. And I see this from many different people from zero previous personal connections to whom an aha moment happened. And they recognize, they see, they look for points of identification that uh, could help them build uh, something. For instance, in the state of Kansas where I teach, the state symbol is the sunflower. And they also grow a lot of wheat. And the wheat was actually brought by Mennonites from southern Ukraine, from southern Zaporizhia Oblast, where now all this war is happening, Melitopol, that area. So Kansas has a direct connection to that. And this is now the number one wheat producing state in the US. And we can go into the, all the history of global wheat market competitions between the Russian Empire and you know, United States. It is all connected, ladies and gentlemen. It really is. Bravo, thank you for saying it. <laughs> we're I happily, didn't know. We're happily laughing at it because, uh, yeah, everything is connected. Yeah. How do you want to see that everything is connected? Um, uh, I thought that um, mm, this practical answer uh, answers uh, mm, can also um, change the traditional perspectives, let's say. Uh, for example, when we think about the uh, situation of Ukrainian contemporary culture, and there is a struggle uh, between a fraction that thinks that Soviet legacy should be distracted, uh, should be um, distracted, should be like erased, and the people who think that uh, it is important to take reflection on this. So I think that one of the important decolonizing uh, strategies is also to look at the difficult past, not to, raise, not to erase this. For example, my friends from Method Fund, uh, Ladana Konechna, Ivan Melnychuk, Katia Badianova, with whom I am working for the last uh, uh, half year, uh, and many years before, but uh, now it's more intensive. They are thinking about uh, uh, the influence of Soviet Union 
onto contemporary Ukrainian culture, for example, how the social realism uh, influence into the uh, con contemporary Ukrainian culture. And I really like the question because it's not the uh, trial to say we all uh, erased from the avant-garde movement, but they do understand that this last few thousands of years were strongly connected with the institutions, with the depiction and with the certain kind of so uh, look at this looking at this difficult moment of uh, past uh, uh, is also like important to take it into the consideration and uh, the, the other sphere which uh, came uh, into my mind is that actually Ukraine answers for this question of uh, global change in let's say economy for example people who are st staying right now in Ukraine they work but the work is not devoted to earning money. The work is strictly devoted with preserving other people's lives, to, to give them food, to preserve their health. And this is really a unique situation when all energy goes, into, goes to, to, to the other people in the gesture of uh, solidarity. I believe that uh, social connection in, uh, in Ukraine then, that we see in, uh, during the Dignity Revolution and uh, before uh, have this uh, specific um, uh, attitude that is not typical for uh, uh, Eastern European and Western Euro European country. It's not typical for United States of Africa. This is something between, and this is kind of new answer for the lifestyle, for, for the future. I would like to see this uh, type of connections as uh, our possible chance to survive the climatic ca uh, catastrophe. I want us to stay for a moment with this uh, um idea of everything is connected because I, I do believe that that's a um, highly important part of the decolonial optics to show, to highlight, to sort of expose the interconnectedness uh, of everything in the world. And if we land back here in Venice, you know, we talk about art, that's uh, part of our also title for a discussion, we're here in the land of art. I wanted to say that one of my uh, strongest impressions uh, in the Biennale so far was the Estonian Pavilion. Mm -hmm. And the Estonian Pavilion this year is happening in the Dutch Pavilion, so the Dutch Pavilion moved elsewhere and sort of cleared the space, offered the space for Estonia. Uh, and the story in the Estonian Pavilion uh, which is created by the curator uh, Corinna Apostol and uh, artist Christina Norman, is um, a research and a story of an uh, Estonian couple where the husband uh, was a writer and a researcher and uh, the wife was considered as a housewife and they traveled to Indonesia at the end of 19th century, which was then the Dutch colony, and she started, she, she got in love with um, uh, orchids and she started to collect and draw uh, different species of orchids, but also other um, exotic um, botany. And this, this story of the people from a small invisible country and a woman as an as a invisible person next to a man getting entangled into the colonial history of the world by sort of picking and cl clearing the, the botanical species out of their background, of their context, and also then contributing to this global um, craziness about orchids. It's a very touching and very um, deeply written and, and shown story about, yeah, about the interconnectedness, about the invisibility of people and processes that have to be visible, that have to come to surface. And for me, this is one of the very important roles that art can or maybe even should play in the whole you know decolonial discussion in general uh, but also in connection to Ukraine which brings me in a way back to the question about what is and what was happening in Ukrainian art especially after Maidan and also now and how to which extent it is connected to this making invisible visible into the emancipation into um, bringing different voices or different narratives closer to, to the surface, to, to being heard, to being seen. 
here probably Anna uh, would have much more you know, practical comments to say, but I would uh, like to highlight uh, as an example one of the absolutely remarkable people who was a speaker at the earlier conference here and uh, to whom, uh, again, I'm deeply grateful to Katarina who for introducing me back 20 years ago, and this is Aleftina Kahidze. And uh, uh, I cannot think of a better person who can visualize a complex issue and present it in a powerful visual form and this will be a visual interrogation. This is, you know, something what scholars sometimes aspire to doing poster sessions at conferences. So, uh, in some ways we can look at uh, uh, Lieutenant Kahidza's art as uh, poster sessions sort of sent to stratosphere in terms of their quality of what she does and she's able through these very powerful images that ask serious challenging questions about place, I mean cognitive mapping, where am I? What is happening to Ukrainian artists as the, you know, the war is going on, as the artist hides in the shelter, as the war is happening around her? Also, her, the metaphors that she's been using, and that is the, uh, the relationship with plant world, talking about climate change, talking about you know, invasive species and things of that kind. Her you know, philosophical thinking and art practice that you know, brings the human and the plant together in very interesting eye-opening ways. And this, and of course, I mean, Talking about Aleftina Kahidza in the wake of, uh, of Maidan and Revolution Dignity in this war, we cannot avoid something that made her, I would say, known to so many people around the world. And this is her series of stories about her mother, who stayed in the Russian occupied territory in eastern Ukraine at the Donbass, and then tragically died of a heart attack and of waiting to cross. Uh, to uh, Ukrainian controlled territory and the monument, the grave monument that Aleftina built for her mother as uh, a gesture for Ukrainians who were lonely and died in uh, the Russian occupied territories and that they are not forgotten. So all these multiple ways in which Aleftina made her personal journey this sort of synecdoche, this testimony uh, of uh, indeed many ways I'm strongly decolonial, so I'm thinking of actually a tes testimonial is a genre of Latin American literature and usually comes from this indigenous position and this is I am speaking of my personal story, but it's a story that is representative of a larger collectivity of people and their experience, whether it is, you know, the indigenous, uh, whether it is, you know, women uh, who are dealing with uh, structures of oppression uh, or representatives of other marginalized groups. And so the kind of art that Aleftina Kahidza has been doing, both whether it's the uh, Kubnik Andreevna project about her mother or the work with the plants or her recent visual diary uh, where herself, uh, her heart ripped out and butcher that drawing, I mean, I think transformed the world. I mean, if one drawing can have this kind of punch in the gut impact, that certainly did to the whole world. So this is an example of Ukrainian art doing this kind of decolonial practice with impact not only internally in Ukraine, but also externally and impacting the much larger world. Thank you very much for um, naming Kaleftina Kahidza. <laughs> um, uh, actually, in uh, our Berlin project, uh, which was based on the dialogue between Ukrainian and Polish artists, they created together one work. We have the pair uh, Aleftina Kahidza and Piotr Bosacki. And uh, it was the poster with the text of Aleftina uh, that plants are as pacifistic as it is possible in this world. 
and she uh, used her very specific type of uh, writing, handwriting, and few pictures of uh, plants, which she also recognized as politic, uh, political space. And uh, Piotr Bosacki uh, proposed a um, mosaic made of uh, plants that were uh, stacked with nails and parasites. So actually plants could not be pacifist in this world because they have to protect themselves. So the metaphor to Ukraine is of course very, uh, very visible. And just right after uh, amazing war of, uh, work of uh, uh, Katarina, Sofenko and Monika Drożyńska came uh, into my, my mind. Uh, Katarina Lisovenko uh, drew a boy with the legs of the bird, uh, and this is the idiom to be on the bird's right. So Monika Drożyńska decided to check what are the rights of birds in contemporary uh, world. And there is a Washington Convention that protects birds, uh, their life, their safety, possibility to grow their and eggs. Uh, and she compared this situation with the Ukrainian migrants and refugees right now in all over the world, showing that probably the rights which are uh, uh, written for the birds uh, a little bit better than the condition of human right now. Uh, of course, the refugees is not only a problem of Ukraine, but uh, uh, this is so close to our experience. Also, this Polish and Belarusian uh, border is very strong topic in our, uh, in our context because it's also the part of the Putin's war against uh, Ukraine and Belarus. But returning to the question about uh, Ukrainian contemporary art and uh, its decolonial practice, I think that we could name at least uh, 20 or 30 artists who are deeply uh, working with this notion, uh, starting from uh, Ladana Konechna, Mykola Ridny, Nikita Kadan, and many, many others who are asking the question about the visibility of Ukraine in, on the global uh, uh, surface of media uh, about the self-representation, about the formal uh, aspects of Ukrainian culture, which is uh, connected with the uh, self-picturing and presenting outside. And I really uh, like the work and the discourses they are uh, developing because it shows that uh, it has deep roots in the global and uh, local uh, reflection. And um, it doesn't, uh, the, the works do not uh, try to repeat the f fashionable moment in the contemporary art. They, they do create their own field. They do uh, create their own questions and they ask uh, them from the perspective of Ukraine, understanding that there is whole world outside and the world should be in the dialogue with this uh, art. So it's really a very uh, deep and great uh, field to study. I happily uh, agree with you, with both of you, that uh, the Ukrainian art, especially in the last half year, uh, creates an absolutely amazingly powerful and very honest narrative, which is both documentary, uh, as if collecting evidence of what is happening to never forget, to never allow um, the atrocities, but also the feelings about it be lost, be sort of you know, covered over with time and history, uh, but also creating a very powerful eman emancipatory uh, discourse from Ukraine with, with the language, with the knowledge, with the, also with visuality, which is very different and um, very often not really falling into the, the mainstream of, of, kind of the, the global, our discourse, uh, which I think is a, is a very important decolonial gesture. Um, and before I would turn to probably last question, because we are slowly coming to the end of the discussion, I just wanted to ask our um, small, but very important audience, maybe there are questions or comments that you would want to um, make. I mean, we're also happy to uh, have our beautiful, friendly uh, sharing here on stage, but um, just in case, if you want, please raise your hand. Uh, and well, okay. 
You come, I give you the mic. Um, my question, very practical. What, what else we uh, can do and what we should do to change the situation? to not allow, eliminate another generation of Ukrainian art and not allow Ukraine fall between the cracks again after the war is over? Million dollar question. I think that I have the answer. Not one answer, but a million answer. Everyone answers from its own perspective. And we cannot have uh, the one uh, strategy. Actually, Ukraine shows the best possible strategy of multiply answers how to preserve life. And I think that this uh, amazing energy of defense in Ukraine shows that uh, that kind of energy also should be grabbed by the world and should uh, be uh, somehow repeated with the different answers for these questions. Everyone should put so much effort to preserve and to help as she, he, it can put in. What I would say is that uh, this is actually something that, that has happened in many periods in Ukrainian past where we see this in times of adversity or in projects that uh, require challenging the immense horizontal mobilization. But what has also happened in the past, whether it's the ruin after the Cossack War or many other later periods, is then the momentum was not sustained and things did fall apart. So uh, I do believe that we not uh, repeating this endless cycle, that, but that a qualitative new breakthrough has in fact happened in recent years. Uh, the kind of transformation, if we move beyond uh, visual art in a sense of the art you see in museums or and move to the other side of the Venice Biennial to Lido where the film festival is happening right now and think about what Ukrainian cinema has accomplished in uh, the last eight years, this, this, is, this is an amazing transformation. And yes, there was a very rich Ukrainian uh, cinematic tradition from the past, but what has happened is we have several generations, both the lost generation and the young generation, uh, all of a sudden found their voice, found their public presence, found social support found miraculously institutional structures and of course we now realize that those structures are very fragile so i'm going to use this opportunity to, to uh, say that saving the dovzhenko center is one of the tasks that all of us need to take part in and make sure that this amazing institution that brings Ukrainian cinema on a global stage in an unprecedented level needs to sustain and to be sustained and to grow. And this is just but one example of we have had, in spite of all the adversity, in spite of all the negative uh, factors hampering it, the growth of the institutional thinking the instead of uh, thinking of life as that per fragility of adversity of uh, subaltern survival that sudden growth uh, of that decolonial process of building the self building the dignity working with the traumas but also imagining a future that has been happening and the war, of course, the invasion is trying to cut that short and we have to make sure that it is not cut short. Thank you, colleagues. I can maybe shortly add from myself that I um, see two important out of many possible answers to your question, Tanya. And one is that um, it's, it's a challenge 
uh, but it's also it's a big responsibility um, for all those who want and to try to be in solidarity with Ukraine, you know, in the global West, but also beyond, to remember and to take this, this war not as an example of um, yet another war in the world, or not as a case of, you know, the war in Europe, but as a case of how um, attentive, caring, solidary approach to the, the, the global tragedy can be um, set as an example to treat other tragedies with the same approach. Because I think this is important. And the discussion about you know, whether Ukrainian refugees are dealt differently than you know, Syrian refugees or you know, Ukrainian artists are being dealt with different than you know, Afghani artists, it's a valid question. But I do believe that the answer to this question or important part of the answer to this question should be, yeah, we can acknowledge that they are being dealt with differently and all the others should be dealt at least the same or maybe even better with more care and with more dedication and more solidarity. So you, in a way, use this case to build more sustainable structures of care for everybody. And another part of a, of a, of a kind of answer to the question, which I think is important and which deeply amazes me is that, well, not from the first maybe weeks of the war, but in a couple of months, the intensity of discussions you know, inside the country, but also kind of around with the participant, different participants from Ukraine, you know, in the arts and in, in science, in different, different spheres, about how to imagine those futures for Ukraine. What can be next? This is incredible. I mean, the war is there, the tragedy is there, um, it's going on, but the people keep thinking, even already now, about how to make it different and how, how to rebuild and reconstruct as of now and when things are over. Just the next weekend there will be a big international online event organized by Kiev Biennial called Reconstruction. Three days of intense sort of joint thinking about how to be together, how to be different, how to rebuild. And this gives me a hope really that things will be different, that things can be different, should be different. Do we have another question or another comment before we? Uh, so, in, uh, so in this time, uh, during the war, uh, too much, our artists went away, uh, not went away, like win or took uh, uh, many art programs like residents. And now it's very intensive story because uh, I think that maybe 50, around 50 percent of our artists now, uh, now study or not uh, work outside to Ukraine. And it uh, means big communication uh, with other culture. We have to explain our story, our pain, uh, and communicate with, uh, with other person. Uh, I would like to ask, what do you think, um, uh, what can happen in future because uh, with this cooperation, because it's a very big, intensive story uh, between uh, our Ukrainian, uh, our Ukrainian artists. It's like a way to globalization, or no, like something like this one. Um, so you, you're, you're trying to ask: Will this uh, intense, intense communication between Ukrainian artists and cultural scene that are outside of a country? Uh, nowadays, will it bring any kind of change or quality change in the perception of Ukraine, right? And, and in the interaction between the Ukrainian actors and the global field, let's say. Uh, from the perspective of Poland, I can already say that uh, Ukrainian presence for the last half year brought a lot of knowledge about Ukrainian culture, a lot of uh, projects. This culture was present uh, very strongly in, uh, in Poland for the last 20 years, but right now it's uh, a flourishing uh, uh, cultural life on very different levels since the very local 
uh, basic houses of culture to the most important uh, art institutions. And I think it's really great opportunity and thank you very much for this question, uh, not only to find the shelter but also to uh, bring knowledge and the Ukrainian perspective. So uh, it's always like double binded. I would add that yes, uh, Poland of course has been a country that has been especially attentive and especially supportive of Ukraine and Ukrainian culture already for many years where we uh, I do see that that there is a bit of a paradigm shift happening in other places in institutions in other countries especially I'm thinking in the English speaking world uh, in the UK in uh, the United States uh, where museums where organizations that organize art exchanges uh, are really waking up to the need uh, to host, to engage, and we, I hope, will be hearing more about this from Alex Halberstadt, uh, not to put you on the spot, Alex, but I think this, there are some many really important initiatives that are happening, and we are all very happy about them. We've been talking about many, many things, and many aspects and many um, memories and names. So what I want you to do for the finale of our um, conversation is to maybe try to sum up our thoughts and, and a discussion or, I don't know, maybe bring something else on the table. But the question would be, you know, we started with um, diagnosing, um, in a way, epistemic injustice. Mm -hmm how the epistemic justice can be done towards Ukraine and maybe sort of globally today? Well, uh, Miranda Fricker, the feminist philosopher who introduced the concept of epistemic injustice actually has recipes in her famous book. And one of them is to, uh, it requires for a person who is in the privileged position to become, to make an ethical step of being an active, engaged listener. That's the very first most important thing. Uh, it, it, structures of epistemic injustice preclude from the experiences of being seen from being testimony of being heard and being recognized and believed. So the proactive, uh, engaged, respectful listening is the very first step that has to be taken. The question is how, d I mean, this is, uh, you cannot, from the position of the formerly, you know, underprivileged, subalternized, made it unseen and unheard, demand that gesture. We can, we do demand, but there, there has to be a reciprocal movement of recognition. I think the hopeful news, if there is a hopeful news in how the world has reacted since February 24th, is that the world is making a proactive gesture of listening. There is that reciprocal engagement. There is soul searching about the previous epistemic injustice. And that is a step in the right direction. It is a crucial question, as well as the question of uh, Tatiana. What has to be done to conquer epistemic injustice? Um, I think that one of the important element is to look at our own personal privileges. Uh, how do we use them? Where we can make step back and when we can invite someone else on a stage which we already have. Uh, in my personal practice, it is uh, a try to find the people who are not strongly present in uh, Polish culture, but they are from Ukraine, 
and to support their uh, presence with the interviews, with the text about them. Uh, so not only look at the key figure, but to make this field more wild. And um, the other thing is like uh, the principle of realistic. Uh, people do not like to leave their privileges. <laughs> so uh, we can play with this uh, using uh, different strategies, showing the different possibilities of uh, connection as uh, something that would be pr fruitful for many, for many sites. Um, I think that uh, we should change and that the war, that the war in Ukraine uh, is not uh, only the war in Ukraine, it is the collapse of global uh, system and we don't know what will happen soon, but probably the um, field of the game will be completely different. And the good idea would be if we would be more solidarity egalitarian and sharing with the goods, uh, but the other option is also possible. So I think we have to keep both of this uh, possibility in our minds, thinking about the future. Thinking about the future, I want to um, refer to um, Senegalese philosopher Felvin Sar, who, among other things, um, sort of coined the notion of Afrotopia, and he was writing about the, this utopia as a thinking about a different Africa or Africas from the decolonial perspective. And uh, he wrote that one of the important decolonial gestures uh, is to be active in creating our own metaphors of the future and to imagine and then finally to create the societies that make sense for those who are living within them. And I do believe that that's exactly what we are doing. I mean, as we as people sitting here on stage and you know, people in the audience with a lot of empathy and connection and we joy of thinking about the futures for Ukraine and um, you know, imagining them, but also all other people who engage in talks and, and artworks and help and all other possible solidarity movements, we are creating a society for those people who are going to live in it from inside, not from outside. Mm -hmm. um, and I do hope that um, what in the first, I think, months of the war, um, Marko Pavlishin, whom you um, mentioned today, said that in this war, Russia is fighting for the past, but Ukraine is fighting for the future. And I do believe that that's exactly how it is. On this um, future note, I wanted to really thank my co-panelists. It was a huge pleasure to be on the stage with you and to have a joint discussion. And to the organizers, uh, to the Ukrainian Institute, to the Venice Biennale and all the partners involved. It's just the beginning. There are two more days. Um, please stay with us. Thank you. <laughs>